Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Putting it all together. Presented by Jesus and Mary Magdalene on the 11th of August, 2013 in town of Mergen, Queensland, Australia. This is session two, part two. Well, yeah, um, a lot of the answers, the reason why they take so long is because there's a lot to explain, you know, and uh, oftentimes too, I think we want a yes or no answers, or we'd love to have a simple answer, or, or many of us would prefer to have the answer that says, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, often. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's very it's very good if if uh if we can fa be fairly thorough. But but can you see that a lot of the things we've already discussed in the last couple of hours have been about fear. And and in fact, many of you don't realize how important it is yet to actually address fear. There's still a, a desire to avoid fear and a desire to, to do almost anything but feel fear. And I remember a conversation myself and Mary had that would have been probably maybe six to 12 months ago now, I can't remember exactly. Um, and Mary was asking me at the time, I think it was she was writing a blog about... Um, no, I wasn't, but I recorded this conversation because I wanted to write the transcript on my blog. That's I right. I think that's what you're thinking of. That's right, yeah. So, oh, no, no, you no, wanted to write a blog else. about uh, being present yes. in your body. And Mary started listing all of these things. I was reading what Mary had written, and she listed all these different things about how to stay present in your body. And she listed, you know, all these things about drink and eat and... I haven't, I haven't posted them on the blog yet. You're spoiling the suspense here. Yeah. Well, anyway, all these different I'm things. I'm joking. Just share them. <laughs> and, and I said to Mary, look, darling, I don't know why you're writing this blog. And she said, well, wh what do you mean? Like, what's wrong with it? You know, Mary often goes, what's wrong with it now? <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> and she doesn't do that anymore, but that was used to be the case. And... Um, and I said, well, you don't realize that everything that you've said would automatically happen if you didn't have any fear. So, you know how people write all this stuff about how to be present in your body and all that stuff? The only reason why you're not present in your body is because you're afraid. And you're not feeling your fear. That's the only reason why you're not present. Fear, in fact, is the main reason why you're not doing most things. <laughs> right? So, you know, when we say to you, like, you have to admit that for many of you, you've now listened for three to five years of presentations involving divine truth. For many of you, you've been to, like, 60, 70, 80% of the talks we've ever given. Now, I would call that, 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 I would call that dedication, Right? Now, there's a reason why you're dedicated like that. There has to be a reason. There has to be a soul-based reason why you want to do that, given the fact that you've hardly progressed in that time. <laughs> so I honour the fact that you have inside of yourself a desire for these things. There is inside of you a desire for these things, a desire for love, a desire for truth, and so forth. Many of you have a desire for these things inside of you, right? You do. But you know what causes you to dishonor these desires? Just fear. Fear is the only thing that every single time, each of you, whenever you fail honoring these things, it's always because of this. Always. And, and can you see from that concept that fear then must be the thing that you address the most. Because without letting go of it, right, the many of these things will not be possible. 
Many of them will not be possible. Every time you want to fear, you will not be able to be loving, ever, actually. You will not be able to be loving. So you can think you want to be loving as much as you want. But if you want to fear, you will never be able to be loving. In fact, perfect love throws fear completely aside. But when you're perfectly loved, there will be no fear in you. The only pre thing preventing a person with a desire to be at one with God from being at one with God is the fear that exists inside of them. That they are unwilling to release. Does that make sense? Because if they release the fear, the sadness will just come out of you. It'll just come out. The only reason why the sadness isn't just coming out is because you're afraid of it. So it stays in. So can you see that the majority of work that you will need to use your will to do will be surrounding fear? Now, the, for, for the majority of you, you don't want to know that. This is why I've given so many talks about fear. Because that is the thing that stops you from being all of these things. And it's your exercise of your will to avoid this that causes you to not do any of these in a perfect way. So you can't love while you're in fear. You, can't, you don't even want to hear the truth when you're in fear, let alone do it. When you're in fear, you don't want to even hear it. You cannot be humble while you're in fear. It's impossible. You will most of the time revert to rage or to at least to addiction when you're in fear and you don't want to feel your fear. You won't be humble. You won't have any faith when you're in fear because the only thing you believe in is your fear. That's the only thing you really have faith in. So, so instead of having faith in God, faith in God's laws, faith in the process, faith in love, faith in truth, faith in humility, you will have no faith in any of those things while this fear remains in you. You can think you can do it. You will not be able to. While this fear remains inside of you as a feeling and doesn't come out, and the only way it's going to come out is by you feeling it, while it remains in you, it is impossible for you to love, impossible for you to want truth, impossible for you to be humble, impossible for you to focus on faith and to use your will appropriately. Once, when I say impossible to be humble, that's probably the only thing that's not impossible. Um, but it will highly, well, when you put that above everything else, then it will be impossible. You have to start seeing this as just an emotion. Yeah. Just an emotion. The majority of you don't see it as emotion. You see it as a monster. That's how you see it. You don't see it as an emotion. It's, it is just an emotion. That's all. Okay. Well, let's... Uh, who would like to... Um, Glenda. Sorry? Glenda, you mean? No, no, no. Elwood. Elwood. Sorry. <coughs> um, I'm, You've had your I'm, hand up for a long time. Right, right I've, from I've, I've lived in fear and terror and been aware of it before I met you and since yep. I met you. Yep. And it's been my, my major thing. Um, and, you know, I don't do any of that you stuff. You just watch that mic so we yeah, can hear you. I don't do any of that stuff because of that fear, and I'm really aware of that. So you're, you're now aware that your fear is your God, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. I have been, and, and I was beginning to access some terror and fear. Yeah. And now I just feel I've lost my confidence in doing that. I, w I want to do it. I, I don't care about crying and... Yep. Stuff like that, <laughs> not that you notice. Now, um, can I just stop you for a moment? The comment that you've lost your confidence in doing that. Yeah. Can I say that your confidence was misplaced in the first place? You had confidence in yourself doing it. Right? Right. The person you need confidence in is not yourself. The person you need confidence in to process fear is the confidence in God. Right. Yeah. So when you say you've lost your confidence in, do, in, in doing it, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because the yeah. real person you need confidence in is God. God's got your back, right? And you don't believe that at this point. That's the problem. 
I have accessed that feeling of reliance on him during that little bits. When of you time. did process, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but now I just feel like I'm blockaded by sure. everything. Blockaded, you yeah. know, by self pity, punishment, spirits. Um, so let's re- list some of the things you're blockaded by. So self pity. Yeah. Um, um, self self punishment. Self punishment. Yeah. Punishment. Self punishment. Spirit influence. Yep. Um, huge investment in my facade because I'm af- so afraid of being judged and rejected. Yeah, um, so, so can we say, um, so you're worried about external judgment of you? Is that, yeah. Is that yeah. It? So, so external judgment. Of course, a lot of these things are internal judgments as well, aren't they? I, I, my addictions, I, I just see them and, and, I, and I, I'm aware of them and, mm-hmm. and yet I just can't seem to make that step. To avoid to, them. To let go. It's like yeah. they've got a stranglehold on me that I just, you know, I can't seem to let go of them. They're just yeah. really, really <laughs> difficult. Oh, can I just say to you, it's wonderful what you're saying. Because these are the primary reasons why most people don't deal with their fear, are all these things. So what you're expressing really very well is exactly what the majority of people will need to look at while they're going working through fear. But please continue. Um, um, I also have, have, have come to not feel like I'm relying on other people saying what fear processing looks like and feels like like so what would you call that um it's com- uh, sort of comparing and and finding and and worrying that i'm not doing it doubting yourself doubt, doubt. yes you but doubt really yourself. what it is is seeking um confirmation, confirmation from others isn't it yeah yep yeah seeking confirmation from others yeah yeah, yeah. which can you see is actually just a fear anyway yeah. In other words, you're not going to do it yourself because unless somebody gives you confirmation that you're going in the right direction. Yeah. 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 So that's really just a fear of going in the wrong direction yourself. Yeah. I, I mean, th- I think those are... Your primary ones? The primary ones that I, I feel. and Because that fear is with me all the time, it's sort of like... I. It's not like I'm ever happy or... You know, I can cry and make myself feel okay. It doesn't work like that for me. It's just no. fear. Exactly. The majority of people in fear feel the same way as you do, to be honest. So, so let's uh, look at some of these things. Because all of these things do... That, some of them are things that we do um, in order to avoid. And other things we do because they're a part of our fear that we need to break down. And other things are happening to us because we're attempting to, to get away from the feeling. So, so let's look at... I'll, I'll, I'll try to help with each one of these things in terms of what's actually going on. Self-pity. What, what do you feel self-pity is about? Any ideas? Do you have any ideas yourself? Well... It's it's like you said said yesterday about not there has to you're not wanting to there has to be another way and, and I, I don't know I haven't found it. Um, it's a, it's an a way of avoiding. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a choice to avoid. I agree. And what you're trying to choose to avoid is responsibility for whatever is going on. So it's what, it's usually responsibility to feel an emotion. So instead, you have pity on yourself about having to feel the emotion rather than actually feeling the emotion itself. Right? Uh, it also is, a, it comes from a, it is born from a desire to have other people feel pity for you. So quite often when a person goes into Just self-pity... Put some things up here. Yeah. Yeah. So when, quite often when people go into self-pity, they're also really wanting other people to feel sorry for them, but nobody is, and so you know, they take on that role themselves. So is that commiseration? Desire yeah, for it's commiseration? desire for commiseration internalised, if you like. You want yourself to commiserate with yourself about having the emotion rather than actually taking responsibility and feeling the emotion. Does that make sense? That is a great way of avoiding fear. So these are, a lot of these are actually avoidances of fear, you'll find. So let's look at self-punishment. 
Self-punishment is, is a great way of avoiding fear because what you do when you punish yourself is you prevent anyone else from punishing you during that process. And what it indicates is that you're actually afraid of other people punishing you, but you don't want to feel that fear. And so what you do instead is punish yourself, and that way you get away with it. That's, I think you mentioned that, or Mary did, as barter. Bartering with God and bartering with others to yep. avoid it. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And there is this feeling that many people have from their childhood, which is an actual feeling in that many of us had created while a child, is that when we punish ourselves, we get away from our parent punishing us. So there is a very strong motivation of avoiding violence in self-punishment. So what you're trying to do when you're self-punishing oftentimes is you're trying to avoid external violence perpetrated by somebody else towards yourself. And so you punish yourself first in order to avoid what they would do if you didn't punish yourself. Does that make sense? So, so again, this is really a fear of other people. Can you see that? Now, this one, spirit influence, is a lot about fear of other people. The reason why we get so influenced by spirits frequently is because we're terrified of what other people think, what other people will do, what other people say. And so we absorb, we are extra open to absorbing what they tell us. And that, because we're extra open to absorbing what a person tells us, we're also extra open to absorbing what a spirit tells us. Does that make sense? And if a spirit tells us to do this or do that, even we may even think it's our own feelings even. That's how much or how willing we are to do what somebody else wants us to do. <coughs> now, many of you learnt that when you were a child as well. And the way you learnt it was the parent projected at you a certain emotion of rage when you didn't do what they wanted right and because when you're a child you're very sensitive to that what happens is that you then learn that as long as you do what mummy or daddy want you won't get the feeling of rage projected at you and you also learn that when you got the feeling of rage projected at you it meant that automatically that you'd done something wrong right now some of you rebel against that but the majority of us don't the majority of us go into doing what the parent wanted instead. And so this is what partly attracts the spirits with us as well. Does that make sense? And this is also why we are so sensitive to external judgment. Because we're, we're basically on hyper alert. If you could imagine it like a radar. So you know, here you are in a radar scanning everything around you, like 360 degrees around you. You're scanning everything. And you're going, okay, 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 oh, there's a bad feeling. Yeah, I call it the rejection radar. I yeah, know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And most people, in fact, know it. They, they, can, they can scan a whole room and look, there's the person I've got to be afraid of. You know what I mean? Because like, they can feel what the barrage is coming from that person. And many of us have this radar very sensitive from a very young age, right? We, we learn to be very, very sensitive about everything that's happening around us. So we've got this radar. So we're... We're not concerned about any good emotion in that place. So if somebody loves us, we skip over that. Because that, that's a feeling you don't have to worry about, right? If somebody uh, proves you, you skip over that. Uh, somebody, you know, really quite likes you, you skip over that. And, and you skip over most things with the exception of only the things that you know are going to be traumatic to experience. Right? So what this does is it makes us desensitized to loving emotions because we skip over them in our scanning and we are ultra sensitive to any unloving emotion. Right? You know that feeling where you're ultra sensitive to the unloving emotion and, and not sensitive at all to anybody really loving you or caring about you. Right? And and so when you're going around, you're scanning this and you're scanning, this is how you see the world now. You see the world, anything love safe, love safe, love safe, everything, everything that's loving is safe. Anything that's out of harmony with love is not safe. Right? Not safe. And, and now our focus becomes, instead of love, our focus becomes avoiding what is not safe. That's our primary focus. So this makes us very, very open to the absorption of the external judgment. What, so if someone has a bad opinion of me, right? so when Robert has a bad opinion of me over there, I can feel that immensely, like, oh, it's just terrible, I can't handle it. And, and yet 
when Robert has a nice feeling about me, I can't feel it at all. And I'm not even open to feeling it because I'm only open to being sensitive to the things that are bad because they are the things that I'm trying to prevent. Make sense? And you know those feelings, right? And, and in fact, to be frank with many of you, you know these feelings, right? Many of you know this is what goes on. But for yourself and most people who are in a lot of fear, this is ultra, like it's a heightened sense of awareness of everything going around as long as it's unloving. Mm -hmm. right? So it's not a heightened sense of awareness of loving things. You, know, you, you don't know who's even loving you in that moment. Because of this, you're very, very tempted to ignore love and only respond to any form of judgment that comes into your sphere of awareness. Does that make sense? And so you're very sensitive to external judgment. Someone just has to say, oh, your hair's too long, and bang, you'll go and get it cut. You know, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. Or they might say, oh, you know, you don't suit pink, and you never wear pink the rest of your life, and you get your whole wardrobe of pink thrown in the dustbin, you know? That, that's how sensitive we can become to just a comment even and they might you know that's just an opinion but we don't see it as opinion we see it as the truth about ourselves because we're so open to it and as a result of that too the spirits who are around us can suggest things to us that are totally out of harmony with love and also totally wrong and yet we'll just take them on board we'll just take them on board every time now because of all of that Right, because of all these things here, and uh, this one here, we then revert back to trying to have an addictive lifestyle. So what we do is we have all of these terrible feelings that are going on that we're not willing to experience because we feel we're going to be overwhelmed by experience. And what we do instead is we focus on addictively trying to avoid such things. Now, of course, the more we try to avoid it, the usually finish up attracting even more of it and before we know we're, we're just we're living a whole lifestyle of addiction but we're still not a really avoiding any of it and that's what often happens for a person who has a lot of fear so all of this is occurring for for only a few reasons all of it is occurring because we are unwilling to do a number of things inside of ourselves we are unwilling to put fear down a peg and place these qualities that we say we want to develop above them, above the fear. In other words, internally, we're not willing to use our will, we're not, we're not desiring even to use our will, to place what we believe are character traits which are of extreme importance for our future life, and we're not willing to place them as a list in the priority list order above the importance of dealing with our fear or trying to prevent our fear. So we have a, a, what, what I would classify as a, a, as a concept of character. We are choosing to base all of our character on fear rather than to have all of these character traits and, and make fear be um, submissive to these particular things. So we, at the moment, you could say that your fear has placed itself on the top, top of this list and all of these things have become submissive to fear. And what we need to do internally is to place all of these things above our fear and put fear on the bottom of this list. Right? So fear comes down here. That's how we'll finish up dealing with it. Now, the question then becomes, how do I do that? Doesn't it? That's what's got to happen. How do I do that? Do any of you have any ideas of how you would do that? How do you go from having fear up here to your fear down here? How do you go ahead and do that? So, Igor, you might have an idea? Can we just do everything opposite to what fear tells us to do? That's one way, isn't it? One way is to do everything opposite to what the fear tells us to do. Now, when I had a discussion with a, a group in 2008, that was my suggestion. It was a discussion about fear is your friend. And uh, in, that, in the discussion of fear is your friend, I made the one single suggestion that was probably the most important suggestion about fear, and that is 
do everything the opposite to what your fear tells you to do. Everything. Right? That requires a very strong will to do that. Yes, I agree. But if you choose to do that, that one choice will change your entire life. In, in, very, very rapidly, by the way. <laughs> and because you will... And, and then the second thing also needs to be engaged. What do you think the second thing is? So once, you've, once you choose to do everything the opposite of what your fear says, there's one other thing that you're going to need in order for progression to occur. And what's that? To feel the fear rather than avoid it. So, so, so there's only two things we really need to do in order to address fear. And by the way, you can address fear without God at all. There's plenty of people historically in the spirit world who have done this. They've let go of most of their fears without having any relationship with God. So it's possible to do this without any relationship with God. With a relationship with God, it's much, much easier, of course. Because you always remember this relationship. You always remember where you're working towards. And as, as, as you release fears, you'll feel a closer relationship with God. So that will give you faith that it's all working. Whereas a person without that doesn't get that. Without the desire for God, you don't get that. So, so without God, you can do this. Or with God, it will be much easier. So you do two things. You place, you, you do everything the fear tells you not to do. And you do nothing that the fear tells you to do. Huh? That's what you choose. Nothing that fear tells you what to do. Everything your fear tells you not to do. If you, that's if you're aware of the fear. So Now many of us when we begin we're not aware of all of our fears. So we can only do it with a few things. But eventually your awareness of fear grows through this process. And you realize oh, I'm afraid of that as well. And I'm afraid of that as well. And so you put that thing on the do not do list. <laughs> or never do list right and you honor these things instead you honor those things instead but but you must choose for this to work you must choose to feel your fear as an emotion you must choose to do it because the reality is if you don't choose to do it all that will happen is your fear will heighten and nothing will be released and what do you think life's going to feel like like that uh, that, that, that's a pretty scary life, right? Because nothing changes. You, your fear has been heightened, but you haven't chosen to change anything. So the, so the second thing, which is the, the primary, one of the primary things we need to learn, is be humble to the experience of the emotion of fear. Does that make sense? So once we do those two things, you will find your entire life will change very, very rapidly. And that's all I chose to do. I just I'd made a list of all of the, th the list that I made. A, and this is why I've encouraged you to make a fear list, right? I've made a list of all of the fears that I was aware of at the time. Now, even right now, I've got fears that I'm not aware of, right? Because if I didn't have them, I'd already be at one with God, right? So I know that I've got fears I'm not aware of. So one of the options is to start praying about what am I not aware of? Because that's very important. But, but most of us have a long list of fears that we are aware of. So what I'd suggest is you write down those long list of fears you are aware of and write down all the things you do as a result of wa wanting to make those fears go away or wanting to, you know, what addictions you have as a result that cause those fears to go away and choose to not do it anymore. Choose. So if you have a mic back. Thanks. So how <clears throat> I've gone about doing this is I've avoided all those things and I'll get up in the morning and I'll feel fear. Yep. And I'll go off and feel the fear, not, not doing any of that stuff like, you know, doing something that... That, um, that, that triggers your fear. Triggers me. It's, exactly. it's just there and I, I do it. Yes. So, so my suggestion is go now and do the things that you're afraid of doing and choose to feel your fear while you're doing them. Does that make sense? Choose to feel your fear while you're doing them. If you find you can't feel your fear while you're doing them, imagine yourself doing them and already some fear will come up and you'll be able to feel that first and then eventually you'll get to the point where you'll be able to take an action where you can feel fear while you're doing it. Right? And... Go on, babe. Uh, 
No, you were mid-stream. I didn't... No, no, no. Yeah. Oh, I had a couple of questions, Alwyn. One was, what you said you had some confidence doing this and something changed. Did you go back and discover what had changed? What, what event happened that made you change? Yeah, I was, I was talking to someone who was working with me and they were talking about that I had to fear what was in my body and that sometimes I was using fear to not feel my fear in a way, to not get to stuff. And it just somehow just put me off kilter. And I Can I ask who did that? Is it somebody who... It's, it's someone here and I, I don't want to... All oh, right, a yeah. therapist. Yeah, yeah. That you were going to get yes, therapy. Yes, yes. Can I suggest to you, whoever that was, and I don't mean to offend the person who it was, who's obviously here, she has no idea. And I've probably already told her she has no idea. Um, it, it might have been my interpretation of it rather than them. Yes, Nece but... Not necessarily them. You know what we find with most therapists? They have a deep desire to keep you away from your fear. Because one of the reasons why many therapists choose therapy is because they are afraid and they don't want to address it. Now, I said to Peter yesterday, Peter came to me and had a chat with me about an issue that he was facing. And he had got some advice from somebody else and who has exactly the same problem to a, in a larger degree than what Peter has. And that person gave him advice, which at the time Peter accepted. And I said to Peter, well, you know, the person that you have advised you, he has the problem worse than you do. Now, how can he, who can't see his own problem, how can he accurately advise you what the problem is? He can't even see his own problem, so how can he advise you what your problem is. He's not going to advise you accurately on your problem. Now what we see a lot of therapists doing is not accurately advising people about their problems. And a lot of therapists want to lead the person down a certain path because they have spirits with them leading the person away from their emotions, not into them. Right? And they view that as a, the, as a success. And it's not success. I've had confidence in this person and, and, and they have helped me with stuff. Of course, there are things they will be able to help you with but they'll only be the things that they themselves have personally dealt with to a degree. Does that make sense? So, so any therapist you go to is going to be able to help you as long as they don't have the same problem. And the problem is that many of the therapists do have the same problem. Does that make sense? So they cannot help you with those particular things. Now, what I'm suggesting to you is that many therapists who have a large degree of fear. So they often do not help people with fear. Right? And, uh, and I find quite frequently do not. I've only ever had one therapist who helped me with fear. And you know what? The three or four months that I went to him, he never said a word to me. He didn't. He'd just say, get on the table. Get on the table. Two hours later, get off the table. And he never spoke any other time. He never suggested anything to me. He never made any suggestions. He never did anything. Right? And you know what I found from that? What I felt from that? He had an intention for, for me to go through whatever came up. And something when you're receiving therapy is that you can't push through <coughs> the layer you're at. You have to feel the layer that you're at. So if someone is advising you to push through what you're doing rather than experience what you're doing, it can't help because that, that resistance can't leave your soul unless you feel it. So the reason why Corny started the healing group uh, thing was because a lot of the ideas and about therapy that are on the planet today don't help people. That's why people go back to them over and over again for years and years and years, right? They don't actually help. Many, many of them don't. The only way, and the only way a person can truly help you on an issue with fear is if they've dealt with all of their fear. And how many people on the planet have done that? 
Zero. And that includes myself. Zero. So I am not going to be able to help other people in certain areas. Now, of course, I've dealt with lots of my fear. And the stuff that's left, a lot of it is about identity, being Jesus, and my memories about you know what I used to do in the spirit world. You don't have all of those things to deal with, so there's high likelihood that I'll be able to help you some <laughs> with most of your fears, right? But I can't help you with everything because I haven't dealt with everything. And that applies to everyone. The only person who can help you with everything is God. And the only thing you can do is trust that process with God. Trust that process with God. If I can just explain why I asked you that question. It was very good what we talked about in terms of therapy. But it's something that you can do to help yourself. If you felt that you were in a place, and this goes for everyone, where you were feeling more humble, you felt like you were um, accepting more truth about yourself, you were using your will, Processing you had things. faith. So you were feeling more positive, even though you felt afraid, you were feeling positive. And then something happens, and suddenly you're in this place where everything feels terrible and you're down on yourself and you've got no faith anymore, go back to what happened. And what you felt at what the time. What happened and what you avoided, what fear you avoided at the time. Because when you deal with that, that same trigger can never send you into this downward spiral again. And can I just also say, Alwyn, I feel that you are in, like, similar to Ivana, like I feel like you've made steps that other people here have not yet made and that is that you are very self-aware when it comes to your fear mm. and aware of the ways that you avoid, avoid it, it. Uh, and for a lot of people it, just like I was five years ago mm. I was like I'm not afraid and a lot of people still feel that even though they might intellectually say yeah yeah I've got fear you I can feel you you know it you know it that you've got fear yeah. so that's a good thing it's a step in the right direction yeah yeah so stop seeing it as a step in the wrong direction. Does that make sense? Like, it's very, very good that you're now aware of a lot of things that you were not, weren't aware of before. And, and while you've been aware of your fear prior to meeting us, you probably haven't been aware of all the ways you've used to avoid it or all the ways you've used to control it or all the ways you've used to have a happy life with, and while it's inside of you, now you are. So this is very good. And you've also, you've all, you're also learning a really valuable lesson about what happens when you avoid a fear. It opens you up to a whole lot of negative things. And if you can go retrace your steps emotionally to that point where everything started to go pear-shaped, and I often say that to people, what happened in the relationship where suddenly things went from feeling like they were progressing to now they're in, like, feels like everything's stagnant and we feel terrible, or or in your own progress, or whatever it is, go back and find what is the thing that I skipped. There is always a thing that you skipped. Mm. And dealing with that will not only ensure that you don't, that same trigger doesn't do that again, it'll help you in a lot of other situations. Mm. Yeah. What's the time? Thank you. 30? 25 to 2? 25 minutes, okay. Um, let's go for a guide this time. We've had a lot of girls, so... Let's go for Alan, shall we? Yep. <clears throat> Sometimes I feel both, but um, I, I, I am a guy. But you feel that you're a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're saying? A lot of those <laughs> questions from the ladies relate to me, but yeah. Um, they do. Like uh, m many of the men in the audience are completely... Uh, uh, detuned from all of their fears however their fears are often very different to a woman's fears yeah which comes to my question yep. um <clears throat> so, some time ago um i experienced uh, a relationship with a person which we would call a walking uh, she yep. thought she was an et yep and my question is i had a relationship with this person yep. and i want to know what the causal emotions for me because I, I look at her as an effect in my life. She is, but, yep. Yeah, and I don't... Um, I basically had enough of relationships at this time in my life yep. and I 
went celibate and so just, you'd almost decided you're not going to have any more relations the rest of your life almost yeah my best mate thought i was gay and go down that track <laughs> and i went nah i just can't do that yeah. i knew i was heterosexual yeah so i did some ceremonies and did the natural love love praying that i only wanted my soul mate yeah and this many many months later this lady turned up whom you thought was your soulmate at the time? Well, she thought I was her soulmate. Right, yeah. So and she used the right terminology and everything. Yeah, interesting, AJ. I didn't find her physically attractive. Yep. But I found there was something in her that drew me closer to her. Of course. Yeah. And we ended up entering a physical relationship later on as well. Yeah. Um, she had, this is the key point, she was the most developed person in love that I've ever met in my entire life. Yep. From 27 years of trying to find out what this is about, yep. being on the planet. And yep. the only person who I've ever met in my entire life who's more developed in love than she is, is you. Right. Um, which I believe, in hindsight, that she's helped me find divine truth find right. you, yeah. I guess. She, out of all the people that she could channel and communicate with, in her journal writing, which yeah. was thousands of pages, yeah. um, she talked about you, Jesus, more than anyone else. Yep. But she was in communication with some pretty out there beings from the Arctarian well, she, realms. and. So she believed she was an ET? At, at, at the beginning of our relationship, yeah. Yep. So she meant, yep. And then she told me some things about Chris, yep. which is the person who came to Earth through the, nat the normal channel. Yep. She was incarnated. Yep. And Chris gave her permission for her to take over her body. So when I met her, she was Aisha. So her so who's first Chris? name was Chris. Chris is, is the Chris? female girl. Yep. That's her. Yeah. That's how she was born. That was her birth yeah, name. Yeah, and yeah. then there was this... What Aisha. was it? How do you spell it? E Y E. E Y E. S H E. S H E. Right. Yep. And and I so was. She, <laughs> she, she, Chris gave her permission to enter. Is yeah. That what she basically, the way she worded it was um, through the Christ consciousness grid system, Chris gave her permission to enter her body because Chris didn't want to be here anymore. When I met her, she was all Aisha. I didn't know anything about Chris. Of course. And it, it was six years after the transference happened when I met her. Right. Um, and did you ever find out during your relationship anything to do with Chris? Uh, yes, through anything the ex-husband and the daughter, I found out a little bit. So nothing from her? Nothing from her? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, she was quite open to talk about Chris's life. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, gotcha. Um, so, I, I guess I'm so trying to keep it... What's the question, Alan? Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to keep it short. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it's a big... It's a whopper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a whopper burger, you know? Well, it's already a whopper experience. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't get, get my mouth around it. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the question is, why... Like, she was... She wasn't afraid. Like, you display so much lack in fear, you know, and that... That really rocked my world, what she could, how she could present herself in public and do and say and stand up for everything she said. Yeah. Um, she didn't believe that she'd been here before. Yeah. And I felt different. I felt that she'd maybe died as a baby. Yeah, as a, as a, actually as a uh, uh, miscarriage. Yep. Yes, yep. yeah. So my question is, what, what was in my soul that attracted this woman in my life like in my prayers i was asking on the new age path i would like to experience the highest divinity of the feminine aspect being well you, you got that didn't you i felt <laughs> yeah it was it a, ro wasn't roller a real coaster <laughs> <laughs> i did get that definitely yeah. um i don't know where she is now we're you know, obviously not together <laughs> that was a long time ago but yeah. um the reality is that, that there's some terrible things happening with her and her life, and with Chris, of yeah, course. Yes, yes. Um, and the fact is that Isha is not as loving as what you believe her to be. Yeah, mm. yeah. The reality is she fed most of your addictions. 
and in doing so made you feel like she was the most loving female you've ever met. Does that make sense? And this is one of the reasons why you attracted her. You attracted a spirit, Isha, who was willing to overcloak a person on earth, Chris. And Chris, of course, was willing to engage the process because Chris didn't want to live on earth anyway. And so this person, who was actually Chris, absconded, you know, like left herself to the extent that, that she allowed this Isha to overcloak. Now, this is because Chris didn't want to feel a lot of emotions. She didn't want to feel a lot of her life, a lot of experiences she was having. She didn't want to feel almost everything about her life. And as a result, she didn't want to be even in her own body. And as a result, this allowed her to become, to allow this spirit, Isha, to overcloak her to such an extent. Does that make sense? Now, the question for you, you, you know probably what's going on with all that now, right? You, you understand what have happened. By the way, I wouldn't say she is loving this spirit. The spirit is a spirit who is willing to overcloak another person. She gained permission, that is true, but she was willing. When I say gained permission, Chris did not want to live in her own body. So, so that automatically means that the spirit felt, felt they had permission to take over the use of the body. Does that make sense? Um, but a spirit in a, in a good space of love would never choose to do such a thing. Right? They'd, they'd want choose. to help the person know why they don't want to live in their body. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. So, so they'd never choose to do such things. So Ishu it was not in a good space of love. However, she was perfectly happy. She, she would have heard your prayer, in fact. And she would have been perfectly happy to support every one of your addictions, which would have made you feel like pretty good in that moment, right? Yeah, yeah. And even though you weren't physically attracted, eventually you even entered a sexual relationship yes. based on all the other things that you felt. Yes. Right? And, and this is where your issues get highlighted here. So your issues are, what was she doing that made you feel she was the highest of, of female divinity that you've ever met? Yes. What, what did she do to make you feel that way? So let's, you remember? Um, well, she made, made me feel special. Special, yeah. Um, she believed that I was very open as a man. I was quite open to learning new truths. and, and so, ex, yeah. so she honoured your character? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, what did she do? She believed that um, I was grounding her because she hadn't experienced an earthbound body before and right. that I, by having, using the Kundalini experience and the sexual practice yeah. that we were I was grounding her and in exchange she was teaching me unconditional love <laughs> wow. I'm, I know it's out there I'm just telling no, you no, no, the no, beginning not, of the relationship no yeah. it's not out there no. just hear what you said yeah it's not that it's out there this is exactly what was happening yeah yeah however can you see her version of unconditional love was a bartering system with you because you had to give you still her don't something. See that. She was saying, "You're doing this for me, Alan, so I'm going to do that for you." That's barter. That's isn't a barter. It? Yeah. When, when I look That's back at it, that's not unconditional love. Through the process, she didn't feel that I was her soulmate, and I, f I felt the same, but I didn't know what, what the journey was about. You know. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. Um, and you'd been fed a whole heap of natural love stuff and before a whole heap of yeah. new age things. Yeah. Who knows? After all of that, what you believe, eh? A lot of times, so you just go along with the experience. A lot of times, yeah. There's many things I could say, but it's, it's yeah. 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 So what else did you feel? So so you felt you were doing her a service. So, so you, well, I don't mean that in a rude way, like a sexual <laughs> service. I mean, you felt you were doing her a, a favor. Well, even more than that, she was saying, "Alan, you're special. You are doing these amazing things." Oh, she never actually said it in words. No, no. I just felt. Because I, a prayer had been answered that I was, I felt special feelings about me. Um, yeah. You were doing a woman a favour, basically. Mm. Yeah, that's what she was telling you. But implicit in that was also the fact that she was in a higher condition than you, and you accepted that. You accepted that she was in a higher condition than you. 
by how she displayed herself with other people. Yeah. Didn't she say to you, I'm actually giving you the gift of unconditional love? Yeah, um, later on in the relationship she felt she wanted to know why we came together. She felt that it was always a purpose and that was what she felt it was. She didn't feel that she was here to actually serve people. She felt she was here to serve Mother Earth. And right. that, but, oh, yeah. but I, I suppose in everything that you're saying, you and she accepted that she was in a higher condition of love than you. Oh, definitely, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's definitely. part of what's going on in this relationship. So, yes. So, yes. so you thought... You, you thought and felt and that the woman was be better than you? Yes, more evolved in knowledge and love, yeah. yeah. Evolved, yep. Okay, that's good. Yep. Uh, I don't, by the way, feel that she led you to divine truth. Uh, um, okay. I must say that. Um, however, um, there were a lot of things happening here that were about your addictions and and a codependency based on addictions, yeah. which you have since also engaged with other relationships. Yes. All right? It's the same kind of things, actually. Yeah. All right? So, so this is telling you the feelings that you have that you don't want to feel. The fact is that you want to feel special from a woman, but you don't. The fact is that you, feel, you want a woman to honour your character, but you don't feel they do. That most women you don't feel do that, right? You feel that you a good man doing the woman a, a service of some kind of favour, right? You think that's a good thing. That you have a special role. You need to do that. An fact. exchange or something. Yeah, yeah, you need to do that. And you also have this high uh, thought, this thought quite frequently that any person that you choose to be with is in a better condition than you are, and as a, as a result, you are quite easily led by women. Mm. Women, a woman can tell you something and you feel like you have to consider it. If a man tells you something, you go, mm, maybe, maybe not. If a woman tells you something, you go, probably true, before you even analyse what's being said. Mm, yeah, I, can, I get yeah. that. Yeah. I can see one other common factor. Yep. Chosen, being chosen. Yep. Being chosen. Yeah. That's good, You're Mary. not choosing. Yeah. Someone's choosing Someone's you. choosing you. Yeah, and like, this is also good. a common factor in your relationships, even now. Like other yeah. people choose you, you don't actually make the choice. Yeah, definitely. Right? Yes. Okay, so so if you have a look at all of these things, this tells you the list of unfelt emotions you actually have that cause this attraction, which I don't feel actually was beneficial for her or you. It just fed your addictions and fed hers. It fed the spirit's addictions. And it fed yours. It even fed Chris's addictions, even though Chris wasn't aware so much of what was going on, because all of her addictions are getting fed by the Aisha spirit. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the whole thing was all about feeding addictions. And in fact, most New Age practices are pretty much all about feeding addictions. Pretty much. Yeah, I'm more aware of that now because of your teaching. Yeah. So... so when we look at all of what's going on, the key for you now is to examine the similarities between this and every other relationship you've ever been in. Because in, in the end, it is a relationship, even though it was with a spirit who was taking over somebody's body. It's still a relationship, right? Yeah. And, and it's very similar to every other relationship you've been in. You've wanted these things, and when you've not liked the relationship, it's because you didn't feel one of these things. Mm. And when in the, fact, the one reason why you wanted to have no relationships at all was because you didn't believe a woman was capable yeah. of feeling many of these things. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh -huh. so, so again, if we look at from these perspectives here, right? So there was so much fear in you about these issues, there is so much fear in you about these issues, that you'd rather have the addiction met than, you know, have the fear exposed. And... You're even willing to do it with a person who you're not attracted to, which is not sexually attracted to, which is very interesting how strong these addictions must be yeah. to, to actually overcome the lack of sexual attraction. So mm. they're, they're so strong in you that they overcome the lack of sexual attraction and you actually engage sexually even though there is a lack of sexual attraction. Yeah. That's how strong these addictions are. 
and pandering to that the fe female, you know. Yes. To, yep. I'll get an addiction met here if I pander to them. Exactly. Exactly. Can I just also, before you go into this, point out, um, <coughs> Alan, that a lot of these things you haven't you haven't yet even realised that they're an addiction. Still inside of you, there's elements of this relationship. You believe they're good. That you feel are good and loving, mm. and should be a part of a loving relationship. Mm. Mm. And if if you want to grow towards God and heal yourself in love and actually have your soulmate relationship be really beautiful, it's going to require examining each of these things and say, is that really loving or is that, you know, something I'm avoiding in this interaction, in this yeah. emotional exchange? So yeah. if you look at some of these things, like even the thing you raised about being chosen, that's about all you... It's about you not wanting to have to make the choice yourself. It's about having a lack of personal responsibility. Right? Yeah. When it comes to relationships. So every single one of these things is something going on inside of yourself that you wanted an addiction met with. And this spirit, seeing all of these addictions, remember a spirit can see all of the colours of every addiction and they know exactly what these addictions mean. Mm. And all they have to do is feed every one of those addictions and you'll feel like you're the most loved person on the planet. And I did at the time, yeah. yeah. I feel I've ma manufactured most of them because of the lack of love I had in my childhood yep. for my mother. I agree. And I agree. Um, this is all about stuff that you didn't feel when you were a child. Yeah, and didn't. Yes, right. So. Um, yeah. well, but yeah. but may we point out, as Mary pointed out to you just now, and I don't think you really truly have got it. You still believe all of these things are good. You still want them all. And you, each relationship you've engaged since, you've engaged at the beginning because you thought you had it. Mm. If each of those things. And then after a while you realise, oh, maybe I haven't, you know. Yeah. But, but each time you've always sought these particular things. And in fact, these things prevent you from identifying your soulmate. And I feel that they take me away from my true self. They do, greatly, yes, of course. And I'm just becoming more aware of that now. Yeah, mm. yeah. So if we look at, again, using the exercise, if you will, here. See, see, if I had faith that I needed to deal with my emotions and find my emotions, and I had the humility to do so, can you see, whenever you f felt special with a woman, you'd go, oh, this is interesting, because this is one of my addictions, right? And you wouldn't want to meet this addiction anymore. You'd go, there's something wrong here. I'm feeling attractive because she's making me feel special. Not necessarily because I'm sexually attracted to her and I, I'm attracted to her other qualities and other attributes. It's basically because she's making me feel something that I desperately need to feel. And I, I don't feel able to feel without her, in fact. And, and this is where it's imperative that you're truthful with yourself. Right? And I don't feel you are being truthful with yourself even now. So you've, as Mary's pointed out, you've, you're aware that this is what's happened. But you're not truthful with yourself about the actual addictions that have driven it. You still see these things as, many of them, as good things. You still see many of these things as things that you're seeking for in a relationship. Not being aware that these are actually telling you what your addictions are all about. And you're willing to engage a relationship with a person who might not even be there and has been overcloaked in order to have many of these things met. And so what happens in this case is the spirit notices you with all of these injuries and she goes, okay, it's going to be really easy to have a relationship with this guy, hey? All I've got to do is make him feel special, honour his character, you know, I'm connect with the, show him how he's doing me a favour. You know, and honour and and honour that. You know, honour the favour that's happening, and uh, and all I've got to tell is suggest to him that he's quite, perhaps not quite as involved as myself, and that's why he doesn't really you know know what his attractions are, and also make him feel like he's been chosen by me for a certain purpose, and that's going to make him feel really good about himself, something that he wouldn't normally feel, mm -hmm. and if I if I'm a woman spirit and I do all that for you, you'll fall over backwards, you know. You'll even spread your legs, as the saying goes, like, you know, from a female perspective. <laughs> You'll even go to bed with them as a result. Does that make sense? Yeah, that lack of love sells the soul out pretty short. Exactly. And, and this, is, this is indicating to you, actually, 
that that there is a lack of self-love, yeah. a deep lack of self-love inside of yourself. That's the main reason. And and instead of honouring, uh, being humble to the this feeling inside of self, you're using your will to engage relationships in order to have that have the other person fulfill the lack of self-love. And has this damaged my soul more by of course. exercising down that path? Of okay. course. Now, when you say damage your soul more, of course, most of the damage has occurred when you were in your childhood years, when oh. all of this damage entered you, right? Yeah. Now you're making choices and decisions based upon it. Yeah. Right? And the choices and decisions you're making based upon it uh, are just acting out the damage that's already there. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. My suggestion is to stop acting out the damage that's already there and now start repairing the damage, which will yeah. take you having a lot more strength of character in, these, in this regard yeah. than you've had before. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you. Yeah. But it's a very uh, interesting example that you brought up because it invo you can see how spirits mm. can interfere with the entire process so much just to feed our addictions and we often see that happening hey darling it's yeah like it's also really interesting i feel for a lot of us um remember earlier i was saying to car and how i used to believe the absence of fear that was me feeling loved and happy and I, I realize now that's that wasn't real at all that was just me avoiding some stuff and i felt a little bit relaxed and relieved and uh, as i pointed out to alan about a lot of these things you still have a feeling inside when you get them Oh, I'm being loved. That's love. I was getting a good feeling <laughs> from it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and this is where I feel us becoming more self-aware. Eventually, we begin to feel when an addiction is being met, ooh, that feels a bit icky. You know, it doesn't feel like love anymore. No, no. But for a long time in our life, it can feel like love, and it, it requires sort of self-reflection and really becoming more sensitive to ourselves to, re to start to discern... Am I getting something met here, or is this actually feeling unconditional? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. 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 So you. it's good for all of us to recognise maybe we don't really know what love is yet. Mm. Well, definitely. Yeah. 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 When we have issues of self-love too, if I can point this out, issues of self-love cause us to believe that other people are of greater development than they actually are. Yes. So we then become very susceptible to being influenced by other people when we believe ourselves to lack development in self-love, when we lack development in self-love, and we believe other people to be better developed in love. And the problem with that is we become very suggestible, right? In other words, a person only has to make a suggestion to us, and before we know it, we're doing what they've suggested, even if it's out of harmony with these particular you know, qualities we still go ahead and do it. And can I say that to everyone generally? Because, Alwyn, really that's something that happened to you, wasn't it? Someone suggested something to you and it sent you into this self-doubt and allowed a lot of self-punishment to come in. And Which is an indication of how suggestible you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone else I was speaking to yesterday and I said, well, who's given... You? They had the same situation. They felt they were growing in something. They felt they were making more actions in harmony with truth and less addiction. And they got feedback from someone to say that they were horribly in addiction. And I said, well, who gave you this advice? Do you see them reflecting in their life qualities that you would like to have? Do, are, if they're giving you advice about a relationship, are they even in a relationship? And if they are, <laughs> is it a happy not. one? <laughs> um, because if it's not, it's not even really logical, is it? It's sort of asking it kid in the first year of school to teach me handwriting you know he's just learning himself like we could get together and maybe experiment together but if I start taking all of my cues from him and he's still learning how to form an A my A's are going to start to look a bit chonky themselves <laughs> my A's do look a bit chonky but uh, <laughs> English is not our first language no. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a third language either <laughs> <laughs> Which is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Mary does, but I don't. <laughs> Not very good in them either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, what was I saying? Oh, oh sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> just about, you know, b being open to the suggestion of people who maybe don't have our best interests at heart because they're trying to get an addiction met through the exchange. Oftentimes, too, they don't know they don't have our best interests at heart. So, look at their life. Like, if a person is advising you of how to stay together in your marriage, 
or, or work through marital issues and the person is not in a relationship themselves that's happy, then how can they advise you <laughs> to work through issues? It's obvious their attraction is showing them that they're not either in a relationship or they're not in a relationship that's happy, so they really are not capable of giving you appropriate advice, ever, actually, until they go through the process of having a relationship themselves and working through the issues that cause it to not be happy, until it becomes a happy relationship. Or if, they're, if you notice they're in an addictive relationship, you know, everyone's feeding each other's addictions and they're giving you advice, all they can really do is give you advice of how to meet each other's addictions. That's all they can do. They can't do anything else for you. So be very careful about accepting advice aside from the advice the law of attraction is bringing you. Remember, the law of attraction is God's law. The law of cause and effect is God's law. These laws are giving you the right advice. <laughs> The, a person coming along and speaking to you may be giving you the right advice or may be in error depending on what they themselves have dealt with in their life and depending on their personal situation and depending on what growth they have made, they might be able to give you advice. But this is where it's difficult on earth compared to the spirit world because in the spirit world you see the brightness of the individual giving you the advice. And so therefore you're about to go, okay, well, I'm pretty dark and he's pretty bright, so it's probably worth listening to him, right? But here on earth, because we can't feel love as God transmits it, in other words, we don't feel God's love, we, we have an addictive relationship with love. In other words, we believe, as, as uh, you've pointed out, Alan, you, you believe certain things are love when they're actually not, right? And all of us on earth uh, who have this problem, we believe that certain things are love when it's not. So then we assume, as a result of that, that that person is more loving when they're not. The only person who we could really compare that with is God at the end of the day. What would God do in our situation? Then once we know that comparison or understand that comparison, we will be able to determine who's as loving or who's bright. If we can feel God's love and feel the person at the same time, then it's highly likely we'll have a fairly accurate viewpoint of the individual. Does that make sense? But if we're not feeling God's love at the same time we're feeling a person, then it's highly unlikely that our interpretation of what we're feeling from the person is accurate. Right? And, and this is the main problem that many of us have. So, so what we, we would suggest is focus first on this relationship with God Focus first on attempting to at least try to feel God, to feel love from God, feel what, what its flavour is, what it feels like. And then when you feel that kind of love from another person on earth, then you can be a bit more open to the advice they give you. But if all you feel is an addictive type of a love, you know, where they're feeding all of your emotions and feeding all your addictions and you think you're happy and they're happy and everything's growing great, but, but obviously you know, it doesn't feel real and all those kind of things, and it's not, you can't feel God when you're in that relationship, if that's the case, then I'd be very suspicious of believing that it's love. And I would also be very suspicious of the advice the person gives you because the advice they're giving you is going to be based around their perception not the truth. And if the person, through their personal example, is, is, is not demonstrating in their personal life that they have made changes in these particular areas that you're looking to make changes, then why would you gain their advice? It doesn't make any sense. Because they need advice from someone else on the subject, as much as you do, or even perhaps more than you do. And so our suggestion there would be, again, go back to God, and look at the people around you who actually are, have a developed relationship that you want to have. A developed relationship with God that you would like to have. A developed relationship with their partner that you would like to have. A developed relationship with their friends, with the family, with people in general. With the way in which they treat people you know, all over the world. Look at a person like that and then say, well that's the kind of person that I can receive advice from. If I want to become like that. So that's our suggestion. What's the time? Five past two. So, well, it's time for us to finish. So, hopefully, you've enjoyed that little session of answering a lot of your questions. It's hopefully helped a bit with understanding how these things can be put into practice in practical situations. And uh, and probably what we'll be doing is talking more about those particular things when when we do have question and answer sessions in the future. 
a, a lot of our focus is going to be pulling people back to these basic qualities that need to be developed and then looking at what are the primary blockages to developing these qualities in practical situations. And every single time you're going to find we'll be speaking about fear majority of the time. So, so if you didn't get a lot of the things about today's discussion in terms of your personal life, then I'm sure there'll be many more questions asked by different groups that will be able to help you do that. Thanks yeah. for your time, everyone. Yeah, nice thanks for your time. <laughs>